Hello everyone, uh, my name is Georgia Mason. I direct the Campbell Centre for the Study of Animal Welfare at the University of Guelph and my presentation is co-authored with PhD student Jessica Kate. To give you some background, um, the scale of the use of laboratory rodents in research is vast. So hundreds of millions are used worldwide every year, primarily mus musculus or house mice and ratus norvegicus or the Norway rat. And the vast majority of these animals in typical research labs live in small barren cages. Rats and mice in Europe or Canada have to be provided with nesting or shelter within which to sleep. But this isn't true in, in the US or China. And so the vast majority of rodents that are used are kept in cages where there's just bedding on the floor and that's it. And these conditions are extremely different from their natural habitats. So rats and mice typically live commensally with us. Their natural environments are thus rather unnatural. And for example, a house mouse living in your garage and foraging there and in your house or garden would have a complex three-dimensional range extending several meters in all directions. And within this, they'll create a well-insulated nest they might dig a burrow and here they sleep and they raise their young. They leave it to urinate and defecate and they also forage for food, water and more nesting material all around this three dimensional space. And this discrepancy between the environment they've evolved to live in and the environment we cage them in in the lab matters for welfare. We know this already, despite being brought into the lab many generations ago, um, laboratory rodents are still motivated to use and build nests and sleep within shelters. And on top of this, they're still motivated to explore novelty, access additional space, climb, run in running wheels, urinate and defecate far away from, they, from where they sleep as is natural and also dig burrows. And as a consequence of these motivations, if you provide resources that allow these behaviors to be performed, cages enriched with these opportunities are greatly preferred by rodents. So mice, for example, will push heavily weighted doors to reach a large enriched cage from a small conventional one, and they'll push up to 40 grams, which is more than their own body weight. Furthermore, if you keep rodents in enriched cages rather than conventional ones, you'll see many signs of improved welfare. So one obvious one is you'll see less abnormal repetitive behavior, less bar biting, less root tracing, and also less barbering where animals pluck out each other's fur. On top of this, animals in enriched cages have long been known to be resilient to acute stresses out of the cage. They shrug them off more easily. Um, we also know that in enriched cages, rodents sleep better, they're typically less aggressive, and they're also more optimistic in tasks to assess judgment bias. So the discrepancy between natural and lab environments compromises welfare. Because we need to use the data from rodents to enhance human health, um, this also raises the question, are data from such animals actually valid? Can we le uh, legitimately extrapolate from animals with poor welfare? And applied pathologists have worried about this for 20 years or more. Trevor Poole uh, wrote uh, cogently on this while he was still at U4, and so did Hanno Verbal in his classic Ideal Homes paper. And recently, biomedical researchers have started to share this concern that the stress and reduced brain development of conventional cages might limit the external validity of data from these conditions. And on top of this, other researchers from within the biomedical world have also highlighted that the lack of exercise makes rodents uh, fat or even obese, especially if they're rats, and that the lack of nesting makes rodents chronically cold, especially if they're little mice. So this has raised issues about the validity of data from rodents, but all these concerns and the welfare concerns haven't really done much to have change a kind of to trigger a sort of revolution in rodent housing. <laughs> 
So our approach here was to think about the biology of stress and of stress-related disease. And we reasoned that if the stress of conventional caging does alter animals' biology profoundly, then we should see differences between rodents kept in typical cages. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear the meowing. That's my cat, Luke, he has a lot to say. <laughs> um, animals kept in conventional cages and animals kept in enriched cages should differ in their biology and these differences will not be benign. There's much evidence from humans that chronic stress is bad for us. It accelerates disease and it increases mortality rates. <laughs> Luke! And we found two useful syntheses that allowed us to pinpoint particular diseases um, to particularly focus on. Um, so these two, these two papers, one came from my lab a while ago, um, one came from a psychology lab in the US. And together, these papers synthesize much of the research on humans on how stress um, precipitates disease. And the papers that these reviews cite and the papers that cited these reviews since highlight eight particular health effects of chronic stress. Seven diseases that are reliably exacerbated by stress, and here they are, cancer, cardiovascular disease, stroke, anxiety, depression, viral infections, or asthma, all of these have are in, uh, show greater likelihoods of occurring in chronically stressed humans, but also once they've started, they progress faster, they reach more severe endpoints, um, and they're tougher to cure and tougher to recover from in chronically stressed humans. And on top of this, deaths from all causes, not just these diseases, but all causes, are more likely to occur in chronically stressed humans as well. So we see elevated all-cause mortality that shortens lifespans. And so our hypothesis was that if conventional cages are stressful enough to alter animals' biology, has been, as has been suggested, then we should see increased morbidity and mortality in these cages compared to enriched conditions. And to be more specific, we should see that compared to enriched housing, rodents in conventional cages should be more vulnerable to these seven key stress sensitive diseases that we identified, and they should show increased all cause mortality. So we set out to test this hypothesis using a systematic review and meta-analysis approach. Now, a systematic review answers a research question by compiling all empirical evidence that fits certain eligibility criteria, and a meta-analysis then turns that into something quantitative through the use of particular statistical techniques. And this was a good approach for us because there's just so much biomedical research on these diseases that utilizes both types of housing for rodents. So lots of relevant, lots of, uh, relevant data out there. Now we used some um, well-regarded protocols that are designed to reduce bias and to be uh, replicable. So we pre-registered um, our methodology and we used practices as recommended by say the cocaine handbook. Um, Jess developed an extensive um, set of search terms, which in turn generated 10,094 um, hits. These had to be screened for eligibility, and this is potentially subjective. So um, here we always made sure that all decisions were made by two independent reviewers. And so I should introduce um, our review team. So as well as Jess working on this project, we also had a team, um, Alyssa Kate, Wilder Scott, Charlotte Winter, and Sanjit or Sonu Lintar, all of whom did a fantastic job working on this uh, project. And as well as the people, we used uh, the recommended custom software. So we, um, all literature screening and all data extraction was performed using Distiller SR, which is a systematic review management software. Okay, so the first task was to boil down the 10,000 hits into something more manageable. 
And here, all abstracts were read and everything was kicked out. If it wasn't in English, wasn't on our animals of interest, didn't include mortality data or data on our relevant diseases. And also if it wasn't empirical, if it was just a review article, say. And this reduced the number of articles down to a more manageable 557. And the team read all of these while applying further screens for eligibility. So the full text of these 557 papers were read and further papers were excluded if the animals involved were not living in enriched and conventional housing, but instead were only enriched for part of the day through play pens or something like that. We kicked those out. We kicked out studies that didn't describe the enriched environment or didn't provide photos. Uh, we kicked out studies where enrichment was confounded with social versus isolation housing. And we also only kept in um, studies that measured particular a priori selected disease outcomes. And these were disease outcomes that we'd selected for being particularly stress susceptible in humans and also uh, very widely studied in rodents. And this left us with 186 articles containing 214 separate studies. It reduced the number of uh, diseases to five because um, insufficient work on asthma and viral infections met our criteria. Um, and I should add the 214 studies involved um, around six and a half thousand animals that were pretty evenly balanced between mice and rats. Okay, so to extract the data from these studies, um, numbers had to be extracted and then turned into what are known as effect sizes. And effect sizes are standardized metrics of impact that allow you to summarize the results of diverse studies, even if what they're measuring is quite different and measured in quite different units. And so across our studies, for example, we had behavioral data measured in seconds, we had size data measured in millimeters and so on. And we, by turning these into effect sizes, you end up with unit free standardized measures that are all on a similar scale. So without going into too much detail, we basically had two types of effect size. For our stress sensitive diseases, for each measure, we extracted the means from each housing condition, the standard deviations, the population sizes as reported, and use these to calculate a standardized mean difference for each study. Now, a standardized mean difference and examples include Cohen's D and Hedges G, which is what we used here, essentially involve looking at the difference between the means. So here, mean values for enriched um, and mean values for conventionally housed, standardized by dividing them by the pooled standard deviation. All you have to really take from this is that you end up with just a lovely standardized measure and an SMD of 0.5 is typically taken as a medium effect size and SMD of 0.8 is typically taken as large. Now for the data on mortality, we had to do something rather different. So here, Jess extracted um, data from survival curves published in the papers to reconstruct Kaplan-Meier curves, which then allowed her to calculate hazard ratios that compare the two groups. Now a hazard is essentially the probability of an event here death and a hazard ratio is the relative probability of this event at any one time. So a hazard ratio is just at any moment in time, how much more likely is an animal to die in enriched housing versus conventional housing. Okay, um, as well as testing our main hypothesis, we had some supplementary research questions as well. So one was to look for evidence of potential bias because a meta-analysis can only be as good as the studies that are pooled and that are kind of smushed together in, into that analysis. So we checked for bias in terms of publication. Is there any evidence of skew in terms of what, what actually reaches the public domain? And we also looked for evidence of bias within the studies in terms of whether the studies met ideal research practices 
as laid out by the Systematic Review Center for Laboratory Animal Experimentation, CIRCLE. And CIRCLE has a checklist that we applied to each paper. On top of this, we also not wanted to know whether any benefits of enrichment were consistent across rats and mice, males and females, isolated and socially housed animals, and also across the five diseases. And we also wanted to know, of course, are some enrichments better than others? So are they shaped by the nature of the enrichment, whether it promotes warmth, whether it promotes exercise or something else, and the magnitude of the housing differences involved? And so to do this, we extracted um, all the information we could on the on the nature of the conventional housing and the nature of the enrichments offered to the animals. Okay, so to analyze the resulting data, the meta analytic models were run using R and the package metaphor. And this is specifically designed for meta analysis. Essentially, um, it's a random effects uh, GLM. Okay, I'm gonna um, hop to the results at last. So first of all, I'm going to um, start with the least studied disease um, because it's most easy to walk you through what's known as a forest plot. So here are the results for cardiovascular disease. And cardiovascular disease was only studied using one measure, and that was the size of atherosclerotic plaques within the arteries of animals. Um, so a forest in a forest plot, each study is one row, and the um, effect size from each study is summarized here um, by a little black um, rectangle. So to walk you through this, for cardiovascular di disease, we had 10 studies, so we've got 10 rows. In this um, plot, the midpoint of each black rectangle is the SMD for that study, and values greater than zero, so to the right of the dotted line, indicate that conventional housing increases the risk here, the size of a plaque compared to enriched housing. The size of each rectangle indicates um, something about the quality of the study. Uh, I'm not gonna go into that in too much detail. And the red diamond at the bottom is the crucial thing for you because this is a summary statistic. The middle of the diamond indicates the overall effect size across all 10 studies. Um, and the width of the triangle indicates the confidence intervals. So here we have an overall effect size across the 10 studies of 0.72. So this is a medium to large effect where enrichment is beneficial. And this effect was highly statistically significant. Now for the four other diseases, I'm going to start with the ones that were similarly affected by housing. And I'm gonna work up to ones uh, for which there were stronger effects still. So next I'm gonna to jump to cancer. Now, cancer was the most well-studied disease, 72 studies, as you can see in this forest plot where everything is teeny tiny, don't worry about reading it. Now, for cancer, as for all other studies, multiple different measures were taken, and so our analyses blocked for the specific type of measure that was used across the studies. So what I'm going to do now is just show you the summary stats that show the results for each type of cancer measure and then the overall effect of housing. So don't worry about this forest plot. Here is a summary and it's summaries like this that I'm going to be showing you for the other three diseases as well. So for cancer, we have four measures of disease severity, tumor weight, tumor volume, metastasis as assessed for example, through cell counts, and also the number of tumors that spread throughout an animal's body. And what we can see here is all the values are greater than zero, meaning that conventional housing is more dangerous than enriched housing in terms of cancer severity. The overall effect size is 0.71, which is medium to large. And this is highly statistically significant. And this pattern held true across all four measures. Okay, turning to stroke, 
Stroke is a disease that once again in rodents is assessed through um, several different outcome measures. And here we have a summary plot that shows um, the overall results for each. And these pool data from 56 separate studies. So the measures taken are um, typically to do with the functional impairments that arise from a stroke. Some studies take a composite store, score, a functional impairment. Some studies just look at animals' abilities to, to move their limbs in an accurate way. Some look at navigation in a Morris water maze because hippocampal function is often impaired. Studies using tapered beams or rotor rods are looking at motor dexterity. And then finally, studies also often look at the size of the insult itself within the brain or infarct volume. So what you can see here is for the first four measures of function, we have pretty large um, effect sizes that are typically greater than one. And then infarct volume is rather different. Infarct volume is the only disease measure um, that showed a different pattern from all the others. Infarct volume is only slightly affected by enrichments, but there's still a medium effect size here. And then the crucial thing is that overall, the effect size was large. It's now 0.87 across all studies. And surprise, surprise, this is statistically significant. So conventional housing increases stroke severity. Turning to a psychological illness, conventional housing also increases signs of anxiety. So we had 28 studies of rodent anxiety using differential housing, and these used four different measures, signs of fear in a light dark box test, an elevated plus maze, a social interaction test, or an open field test. Effects were very consistent across all these types of measure. Um, and overall, the effect size was large, so conventional housing rendered rodents uh, more anxious um, than enriched housing. And again, it's highly statistically significant. And the final disease for which we had data was depression. So here we had 28 studies looking at different measures that are consistent with a depressive like state. And these measured learned helplessness, hippocampal volume or anhedonia, the loss of pleasure. Um, and once again, we've got large effect sizes here, uh, typically greater than one. These were consistent across all measures of depression. The overall effect size is 1.24, which is really very large. And again, it's highly statistically significant. So conventional housing is indeed increasing the severity of all five of our stress sensitive diseases. But what does this mean for overall mortality? So if we look at the hazard ratio for deaths, looking at the ratio of conventional house to enriched, we find that um, across the 36 studies for which we had data, sorry, 38, and these spanned studies in which diseases were induced that killed the rodents, or studies in which there were no diseases, but animals just died spontaneously, for example, of old age. Across both these studies, the hazard ratio was around one and a half. The final hazard ratio across all was 1.48. And so what this means is that conventionally housed animals at any moment in time are approximately one and a half times more likely to die than enriched house animals, or their risk of death is increased by around uh, 50%. And again, this is statistically significant. And so both the predictions of the hypothesis were met here. Animals were um, animals in conventional housing were more vulnerable to our five stress sensitive diseases, and they also showed significantly increased all cause mortality. OK, so having confirmed supported the hypothesis, we then dug a bit deeper. We looked for evidence of potential bias um, before we got too excited about our results. Um, and we looked across the studies for evidence of publication bias. And I'm not going to go into too much detail here, just for time. 
but I can say there was no evidence of publication bias for the mortality data. There was some evidence of publication bias for stress sensitive diseases. There was evidence that non significant studies using small sample sizes weren't being published. And we corrected for this by moving 12 small scale studies that had crazily large effect sizes, effect sizes over three. Once we kicked out those dozen studies, there was no longer any evidence of publication bias. And it's that data set we used moving forward. We also looked within the studies to see were ideal research practices used. And this is the result of us applying that circle tool that I introduced earlier. So we found that studies scored well in terms of some risks of bias. So green bars indicate good the good use of best practice. So all studies use similar groups at baseline. The animals are similar at the start of the study. Almost all studies were good in terms of re reporting all outcomes. They didn't seem to be selective. Almost all studies seem to be using randomization, even though how was often rather hazy. Where things got a little bit more dicey is um, in the bottom rows. So um, in terms of the unit of analysis used in statistics, because enrichment is being applied to cages, cage rather than animal should be the independent unit of replication in all analyses. But 55% of studies using socially housed animals didn't do this. They didn't use, they pseudo replicated, they used individual instead of cage in their stats. And this means that about a third of all of the studies we used had a problem of pseudo replication in their analysis. Another problem is that outcome assessors often weren't blind, or at least they weren't reported as being as blind. Now, we know that more studies use blinding than report blinding. So if you use blinding, report it in your papers, but only 35% of studies reported that they use blinding, which is really important because a lack of blinding can lead to biased results. And finally, no studies said that they randomly allocated enriched and non-enriched cages across the facility. So this could mean that in any one study, the enriched cages are all up high, the non-enriched cages are all down low or something, something stupid like this. Now across our 214 studies, this wouldn't be a problem, but it's still frustrating that people are doing this. We also found an additional problem, and this isn't a risk of bias within the study, but like housing effects, it, it, it does speak to external validity. So only around 6% of studies used both sexes of animals, and of the single sex studies, nearly 70% used males only. And to this, this is how Jess and I respond to this really, because this is just sexism. Everyone should be collecting data from both sexes of animals, even females. All right, our other research questions were, were effects consistent across species, sex, social housing um, status, and our five diseases? And to investigate this, we used the MODS function in Metaphor, and we used the data set pruned for potential publication bias, so slightly smaller than before. So we're being really conservative now. And what we found is there were no apparent effects of sex, species, social housing status or disease on the magnitude of the housing effects. In other words, conventional housing is equally harmful across the board. Then a question I'm sure is going to be interesting to you. Does the nature of the housing and particularly the nature of the enrichments or what was denied the animals, does this make a difference? You'd really expect it to. So we could confirm that the enriched cages varied greatly in the types and number of resources that they offered the animals. Conventional housing seemed to vary too, although sometimes we had to guesstimate this rather than know for sure, because two thirds of the studies did not describe their conventional housing at all. And this left us having to infer what it was like from local minimum standards, which you know could be a little bit dicey. Of the studies that did describe their conventional housing, um, most of these did not 
give the animals nesting or shelter, but around 20% of them did. So there's some variation in the nature of conventional housing. There's also some mystery around the nature of conventional housing. And this I think is important as is the fact that nobody watches their animals in their enriched environments to see, are the enrichments being used? Are they accidentally triggering aggression? How are they being used? And so because we're a bit agnostic about the precise nature of housing differences and their precise behavioral impacts on the animals, perhaps it's not surprising that we could find nothing for these last analyses. We couldn't find that opportunities uh, for exercise made a difference. We couldn't find that opportunities to be warm made a difference. We couldn't find that having multiple enrichments made a difference. We suspect this is a type two error and that there is there would have been information if only the data had allowed it. So this definitely requires future work. All right, so to wrap up, Conventional housing, as the hypothesis predicted, promotes stress sensitive diseases. It does this across cancer, cardiovascular disease, anxiety, stroke and depression. And it has an overall standardized mean difference of 0.79, which is very close to large. So we're seeing really pretty major effects here. Conventional housing also increases animals' mortality rates. It elevates their instantaneous risks of dying at any one moment by about 50%. And further analyses showed that this meant median lifespan was decreased in conventional housing by around 9%. Now, there were some risks of bias within these studies, but we feel that they were small enough and our overall N was so large that we, we strongly feel that our findings here are true, even if they're possibly slightly exaggerated. So it could be that the true effects are slightly less strong than this, once you correct for things like uh, the bias introduced by non-blinding raters. But it's clear that there are some major effects of housing going on in conventional laboratory setups. So why does this matter? Well, this matters because it demonstrates that, uh, that conventional housing is indeed chronically stressful and it's stressful enough to make a profound difference to animals' biology. It matters because um, it, can, it fits with definitions of distress. So the Institute for Laboratory Animal Research, ILAR in the US, characterizes distress as, be, as being um, the deleterious effects of stress such that biological function is, is altered. Um, the ILAR um, says that stress may begin with subclinical changes that then lead to overt disease. And they warn that animals experiencing prolonged severe stress um, will show immunosuppression, altered immune altered physiological function, um, accelerated disease progression and increased morbidity and mortality. And that's exactly what we're finding here. So what does this mean? This really means that conventional housing should be treated just logically as a distressing, stress-inducing procedure. So we um, feel that conventional housing promoted distress and that logically it should be treated as a procedure. In Europe, it should be treated as at least moderate and maybe even severe. In Canada, in the US, it should be treated as a D or maybe even an E procedure. Currently, conventional housing is just treated as a neutral control, even though it really isn't that. Ethics aside, I think our results also raise some questions about the language we use. So the language used when resources are added to rodents cages is the language of enrichment. Now, earlier I said we put scare quotes around this term because uh, we weren't really convinced this is the best term. And we would argue that if resources improve health and survival, they're not the optional, frivolous, icing on the cake type things that the word enrichment implies. They're basic needs. And so really enriched and conventional housing should be called satisfactory or poor housing. Those would be more accurate descriptors. Now, we also um, said that there's considerable speculation that um, current 
housing protocols may compromise the external validity of data that come from laboratory rodents. Now, our results can't directly answer this question because to do that, you'd need to find out if experiments run in conventional or enriched conditions yield different findings. And we can't tell that from our work. That's a whole different study. But what we have done here is confirmed people's suspicions that conventional housed, conventionally housed animals are, are altered profoundly from animals in more satisfactory conditions. And this is necessary evidence, even though it's not sufficient evidence, for data from such animals to be regarded as questionable. What we can say is that there really are now reasons to worry about the external validity of data from these animals. And we think this fits within um, concerns about external validity that were raised first for human subjects in the world of psychology a while ago, where it was realized that most data from psychology research came from people who were Western, educated from industrial countries that were rich and democratic. And yet from this small skewed subsample of people, researchers were trying to generate conclusions that apply to the world. Well, is that correct? It's, it seems like it, you know, maybe it is, but maybe it isn't. More recently, similar concerns have been raised about animal behavior research conducted on wild animals. And um, a comment, recent commentary in Nature suggested that the study animals used in most field research are strange. And strange is another cool, clever acronym that I won't go into here. So there's growing concerns about external validity and the legitimacy of extrapolating from a peculiar subset to a grander whole. And we really think this is a, this is a concern worth flagging and raising. And we think that issues with laboratory rodents can be summed up with our own acronym here. So our results combined with previous findings really highlight that rodents in conventional systems are cold, rotund, abnormal, male biased, poorly surviving, enclosed, and as a result, distressed, cramped. So are these cramped rodents generating data that apply to all of you? Do they only generate data that apply to those of you who are chronically stressed? We don't know, but it seems really worth finding out. Meanwhile, Jess and I would urge that rodent housing is improved because we just think this isn't okay from a welfare perspective. We also urge that rodent housing is also better reported. Housing is not on the required list of the ARRIVE guidelines, which means many papers don't even describe how their rodents live, even though this is so important, both for their welfare and for their biological functioning. Okay, so we would like to end with some acknowledgements. We'd like to thank uh, the other members of my lab, the wonderful Aileen, Andrea, Lindsay, Michelle, and Prathipa. We would like to thank our fantastic systematic review team. We'd like to, to thank uh, the amazing faculty and students of the Campbell Center. And if you're interested in the work of this phenomenal center, follow us on Twitter. We'd like to thank NSERC for funding. And last but not least, we'd like to thank U4 for um, sponsoring this talk. Thank you so much, everyone at U4.